passing by. All of public communications are encrypted. Great start. Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Opi. You know me. My channel. Why are you watching this video? I don't know. But I'm here with Scrub, uh, Light Bright Studios writer and person who owes me about a couple of thousand dollars in therapy bills because she writes <laughs> very good fan fiction. Never very good. Go. Uh, very good fan fiction. So today... I decided that I wanted to do a podcast because I can and no one can stop me unless YouTube censors this video for any reason in particular, which I don't know if they would or not, but please be kind to me, YouTube, great gods of YouTube. Ugh. Say hi, Scrub. Mm, hello. Hello. I'm eating chicken. Eating chicken. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I don't think eating on a podcast is really... A good thing. Nor Don't is, worry, I'll manage. I'll manage. Nor is cracking open a Dr. Pepper, I guess. But I guess we got nothing better to do. Mm. Uh, yep. So today, what are we talking about? Mm. This is the real question. The many, many outfits of Padme oh, Amidala. God, no, How I don't want to do this. No, I. We have to. I don't. We have to. I, I don't. No, we have to. I, we don't. We talked about we, this we last could. night. We literally talked about this last no, night. We, we use it. We you said. Oh, you know what? Maybe you know this is uh, not a bad idea. Whenever I said that it wasn't a bad idea, I secretly meant that it was a terrible idea. <sighs> because the fact that you know how many outfits Padme has in the prequel trilogy, I counted thirty six. Like Thirty-six. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she has thirty plus outfits in the entirety of the prequel trilogy. That includes all of the uh, deleted scene outfits and all that, which is really mm. awesome, by the way. And totally not a pain in the ass to try and do an entire list for, and you know, measure out all of them in one shot. It's great. Look, if you want my opinion, I, I think Padme having that many outfits is honestly iconic because she is meant to be an icon like in a sense like how i perceived it because george gave padme um such a significant role in which she is because like let's think about the time that the prequel uh, prequels were released it was like decades after uh return of the jedi right. and the people were like craving star wars oh my gosh star wars we're getting we're getting more star wars movies right right and we're gonna see Luke and Leia's mom, dad. We're gonna see Darth Vader before he became Darth Vader, and so, in in essence, you know, having Padme being this huge, huge, integral part of the prequels, and also ultimately what led to um, Anakin Skywalker to become Darth Vader. Like, of course, she's important. So, right. in essence, like the outfits will reflect that. Yeah, that's where. Uh... <clears throat> that's where Leia gets her like signature uh, prowess from on top of being like Norgana and all that but like mm -hmm. just just Padme being Padme throughout the entirety of the uh, prequel trilogy I'm pretty sure that there is not one part in the entirety of the Star Wars prequel trilogy where she has an outfit on that lasts for more than a day or even 12 hours because that even includes like the the Kira Knightley scenes because Sabe is basically uh, pretending to be Padme at that point because you know she's right. she's the queen's shadow and she's supposed to protect the queen and all that. But in Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones, we we get we get to Naboo. She's wearing the refugee outfit. She then changes from the refugee outfit to that weird pink yellow pastel outfit where Anakin's talking about how he doesn't like sand. Then we move on to the picnic, the picnic outfit. Then we have the dinner outfit, which, it, which that's, I don't know what George was thinking, but he was thinking something. And he was no, thinking we, a lot. Uh, George was thinking downstairs. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. And then she changes up from that outfit to the nightgown. That's like six outfits in total. It's great. But... 
it makes you think like I I'm pretty sure her wardrobe costs more than my house. I think her wardrobe would cost more than anyone's rent. No, not even that. <laughs> Year, like yearly expenses, yearly rent at all. Mhm. Mm and like she then she only has like 36 outfits and that doesn't count all of the outfits like from the Clone Wars in 2003, the Clone Wars in 2008, all of the other various outfits that she has throughout the entirety of all of the Star Wars books and comics and micro series and Disney series and Clone Wars series and everything else. It's she has so many outfits that it's not even fair to count them because she never wears the same outfit twice. Meanwhile, we have Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi literally out here busting out the same uniform every day until they decide, you know what? Armor kind of sucks to walk around and we're not, we're not going to do that. Just wear you know, Jedi robes. It'll be fine. With you saying that, it makes me, it honestly makes me think, if you include, if you did a breakdown video of like um, the many outfits of Padme, but extended into Clone Wars and the books, that'd be like an hour long I, video. That's gonna be an hour long. Video. <laughs> How many outfits would that be? Oh God. Well, first of all, you have to count every episode that she's in in the Clone Wars. Right. And every day that is in the books. I would say that's over 60. Easily over 50. Uh, allow me to throw you this real quickly. I'm going to send you this over Discord because, you know. Oh, shit. I'm fancy okay. like that. This is an actual list. It's made by somebody named Trisha. I don't know. I don't want to pronounce that last name because, you know. But these are all the outfits that she has. I'll throw it on screen along with that. Like, there's no reason to have a wardrobe that th that's this massive. And take note, in episode two, Attack of the Clones, all of these outfits happen in like three days. Wait, okay, wait, let me look, hold on. This entire line of outfits from episode two, Attack of the Clones, happen in three days. The only outfit that she reasonably wears for more than one day in the entirety of Star Wars, arguably, is the uh, peasant disguise for Tatooine and arguably the flame gown from Naboo because she has to pretend to be one of the handmaidens before like the entire time that she is on the ship in Naboo and she gets the Coruscant and also the, slip, the peasant gown or the peasant outfit whenever she's living on Tatooine for a little bit while they are trying to find parts for the ship. Okay, I remember seeing this image and looking at it. I mean, in the span of... Okay, if we're talking like the span of three days, to be fair, we know that the time that Anakin was protecting Padme on Naboo, it was like... Was it three days? Or was it, wasn't it significantly longer? It was one that? day. No, wait a minute. It was okay, one wait, day. On. No, I'm looking this up. Hold I on. I thought about it. This is one day. Kong was Anakin on Naboo with Padme. Hold on. One day. How much time did Anakin and Padme actually... I'm on Reddit. Gosh. <laughs> okay. Um... Because Reddit has all the answers. Okay. Um. When they're hiding in Naboo... Even then, they're not dating. Is he awkwardly flirting in a few days? I mean... That's not a few, a few days. days. Sounds a pretty, like, pretty accurate. That is that is um, not. Because, look, I saw the movie, right? We've all seen the movie. And right. they immediately go to Feed Palace, go to that little villa that's on... That, that Italian villa that's on that river... They then mm -hmm. go on a picnic, go to dinner, and she gets into the nightgown. And somewhere in between all of that, Anakin meets her parents and her oh, sister. Yeah. That's all in one day. I don't understand why she needs six different outfits in one day. 
<laughs> that doesn't make sense to me. Um, okay, so, wait, so we know that her pilot disguise arriving on Coruscant. Yeah. That was, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Later that evening, it okay, we're breaking, so we're breaking out episode two, aren't we? Oh, yeah, we're breaking out episode two. This is crazy. Like, okay, okay, here we go. Okay. She goes for the pilot disguise as soon as she gets to Coruscant. She then, right. in the deleted scene after the assassination attempt happens, she gets into this uh, Senate address like outfit, like the blue and the gold. And immediately after that, she then goes to change into a loyalist committee outfit where uh, Palpatine tells her, oh yeah, just get Obi-Wan and Anakin to protect you. It'll be fine. Then she switches out into her nightgown, which that's four outfits in one day. Then she spends the entire day, the next day, this is specifically called the packing gown. I don't know why it's called that. Why do you need an entire decorative, like, $700 gown with, like, bunned up hair just because to I'm pack George luggage? Bitch. Because I'm George Lucas, bitch. Because I'm George Lucas, bitch. Yeah. Then she switches out into the refugee disguise, which she wears all the way to Naboo busts out the return home gown as soon as she gets to Naboo she changes out, goes to visit her parents wears the villa gown wears the meadow gown wears the dinner dress, wears the robe and nightgown my god, and then uh homeboy wants to go to Tatooine so he can save his mom, and she wears the cloak and the uh underclothes that are under the cloak like the I don't know what that is Jesus but some Arabic desert outfit that's like light blue with her hair still in buns and then she swaps out into a blue dress for Tatooine which I don't know if Aunt Baru gave that to her or if she had it on hand because that doesn't look like anything that somebody who actually lives on Tatooine would wear no, I don't think so. Yeah, so she must have gotten that from her ship. Like, she's just been sleeping on the ship this entire time. And... So, wait. Really? I was going to say, when she her, on her time on Tatooine, and I'm glad that the, that the artist who made this labeled it so we can get a good idea of how long. <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah. she links the cloak, the underclothes, the blue dress... Battle clothes. So that's like four different changes. Yeah. And she's, which is weird because she switches out from the blue Tatooine outfit to the battle cloak. And she wears the battle cloak while she's at Shmi's funeral. Why did you do that? I think it's just like. They were planning on leaving right after Shmi's funeral anyway. Yeah, but, like, why would you wear that specifically? Like, you could I have mean, changed she... on the ship. It was, like, all she had, I, I, I would assume. Look, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> I refuse to believe that. Like, this was the one outfit that she had on the ship that she didn't, like, that she didn't plan for. And it was like, well, I guess that's all I got. Not like I have like 17 other pieces of clothing and fabric that I have on this ship that I could wear at literally any time. I mean, okay, so when they made the decision that they were gonna go to like Tatooine, I like I made the assumption that um, she came, she just came prepared, and so with battle clothes because she can fight, we know she can fight. She needs something to move freely in. Yeah. Outfit, and especially going to Geonosis, it. It makes sense. It was just the appropriate thing. Wait, I forgot. Did they know Obi Wan was in trouble, or did like during Tatooine, oh, or no. after the fact? No, like, after they, no, they just they got the message immediately after Shmi's funeral, and then they went to Geonosis. So and she was just work. she was just wearing that outfit for no reason. But also, it's hot in Tatooine, and yeah. you know how she's wearing. Under colors. But she was already wearing the Tatooine gown. She was already wearing the dress and everything. It could have been like a, a casual at home kind of deal. <laughs> it's like, okay, it's like one of those things where I guess I can understand. 
I know there's so many outfits, but like, let's go back to the Coruscants, like the very beginning of episode two. Right. Because she has her disguise and the Loyalist Committee, um, she wears that gown, maybe with the people she trusts. But when it comes to addressing the Senate, and I say this, but arguably she has been around Senate members of the Senate in that same Loyalist Committee gown. Right. But but the Senate address, you know, she's got to wear something that shows, you know, shows her off, you know, that get puts an impression on the people every time she's being addressed. I know it sounds crazy, but I can understand that. Nightgown is a nightgown. The packing gown could have been like, you know, something similar to the Loyalist Committee, where it's just like, oh, it's what she will casually wear. It's not as regal as dress, right. but it's something that still shows her status. Does she really need to show her status while she's packing luggage? I mean, <laughs> yeah, she is a senator. But um, I don't get it. Like, it, it's one thing to like wear a fancy ass gown while you're like actively representing the Senate or while you're talking to loyalists or while you're talking to committee members, et cetera, et cetera. I get that. I just don't understand. Like just wear pajamas or something like just wear literally anything else aside from what you would see out of a like Vogue magazine article while packing luggage. Like why would you, I don't, I don't understand. I don't get it. That's it's not my cup of tea personally. But if you want to rock and roll in like a one thousand dollar Vogue magazine article dress, then go ahead. I'm not. I'm not judging, except I secretly am. I mean, how else was she able to afford this? Uh, she's the queen. If she was the queen of Naboo, she's a senator. I imagine she gets paid. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> she gets paid a shit ton of money. She still makes money from being the queen, like back when she was thirteen which is crazy to think about. And then... It could also... It sounds crazy, but it could also just be a Naboo thing. That you I just, am. you know, are just wear something gaudy. Naboo and... custom illustrates that you must be wearing the gaudiest outfit that you could find while you are packing luggage. <laughs> it's the law! And then, once you move down to episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, you notice that a lot of her uh, clothing, the layers become more and more detailed. So it hides her pregnancy, which is awesome, by the way. I like how right. George threw that little implication in there. Even though she got noticeably, like, very, very pregnant within the course of, like, a hot weekend. That was episode three, Revenge of the Sith. But she was already pretty much super pregnant by the time episode three rolled around. Because season seven of uh, Star Wars, The Clone Wars, showed that she was already there. Like, she was already very much pregnant according to oh, yeah. the hologram she projection. She starting to show. Yeah. So then... Yeah. Uh, you take that, and then you throw out the fact that the time period between that time and when he arrives in episode three pretty much uh, shows that... Pretty much reveals that uh, it's been a couple of months, if not maybe closer to three months since that time where they had that last conversation because she wouldn't have believed that he would have died out in the field unless it had been like months since they last had an actual conversation oh no i mean they definitely whenever they had the chance they definitely snuck in a hollow conversation or two like or two. Oh yeah like yeah judging how we saw that scene play out and poor Rex trying to play it cool, oh, as God. cool as possible, especially with Obi-Wan fucking Kenobi. No. Rex, <laughs> Game five. where's Anakin? Uh, he's uh, uh, working uh, on my gear, sir. Like, he's, why is he working on your gear alone in a secluded environment? It's like, I don't know, don't ask me. <laughs> it's like, he's the, he, he's the, 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 he's the real, he's the real here. guy. Anyway, yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of articles of clothing. Like back in November, whenever I made that video, I was going 
so fucking crazy whenever I first made that video. Because, so like, I was watching um, Star Wars Episode 2 Attack of the Clones uh, special features. Because, you know, on the DVDs they have all those special features like behind the scenes, deleted scenes, all that good stuff. And right. they have, like, this special featurette, which includes, like, hold on, let me see if I can find it on the back of here. I believe Ooh. it is State of Art Pre-Visualization pre Episode 2 and the eight deleted scenes that come on this too. Like, a lot of this shows uh, various artwork and various outfits that Padme wears in episode two attack of the clones and i was sitting there like no there's no way that there's that many outfits and then i watched all the deleted scenes and she has like three different outfits then i watched the entirety of episode two and there's like 12 different outfits and then i watch episode one and she has god knows how many outfits there and then episode three counted up 36 outfits according to some people it's 42 but that that's completely dependent on like if you think about other behind the scenes stuff but either way it's a lot of outfits and i went fucking crazy for about a week making this damn video and i'm sure a lot of you can vouch for me because i would cr you watch the video you go back that's my first video i went fucking nuts the only thing i distinctly remember you going nuts about is how sexy padme was in episode two i know <laughs> yes she was she, okay there's no reason to wear that black outfit. That black outfit has one purpose and one purpose only. It's to make 19 <laughs> year old sexually frustrated Anakin Skywalker feel like he has no control over his emotions. Like you are a 19 year old virgin on the point of your life where you are extremely sexually frustrated. Did nobody play this motherfucker any kind of fucking videos about sex ed back during Jedi training? I don't think they um, did. I don't really think that was Obi Wan's priority. To be very fair, well, someone had to teach this motherfucker. No one taught this man the birds and the bees. No one did. He was nine whenever he got torn away from his mom. His mom obviously didn't do it, and uh, of course Qui Gon didn't do it because he fucking died before he could actually teach Anakin anything. So, whose job was it to teach Anakin the birds and the bees? Obviously, Obi-Wan didn't do it, because he doesn't want to have that conversation with a nine-year-old, and I guess nobody else in the Jedi Order did either, even though I'm sure there are plenty of people that could have done like, that. You, it's like, it's not the most important thing. Like, it was not numero uno on, you know, either Obi-Wan's or Anakin's mind. The, to be fair, Anakin wasn't thinking about say Padme at least in a physical way right uh, okay, okay no I backtrack I backtrack a little bit backtrack a little bit because he thinks she is so freaking beautiful because right. he literally calls her an angel when he was a kid yeah and he thought about her night and day understandably he is now, hyper infatuated at that point very infatuated okay yeah that's why I had like I said that's why I had to backtrack a little bit because I'm like ah okay but if you remember the interview with Christian Hayden's, um, Haydenson and um, Hayden Christensen, but, and also, huh? You said you said Christian Haydenson. <laughs> that is that is that is exactly not yes, his name. I didn't just that, say that. that is exactly the opposite of his name. Actually, it's Christian Hayden Haydenson. Christensen. It's Hayden Christensen. Excuse me, Hayden Christensen. I am losing my fucking mind. Okay, uh, uh, yeah. rewind. Okay. Hayden Christensen, um, and then <laughs> Natalie Portman. You know, also it, it, mentioning Gregor McEwen. Know what I mean? Yeah. Stop! Don't roast me like this, so funny. I'm not. I'm not but, roasting anybody. <laughs> okay. So as I was saying, so basically, how Hayden perceived like Anakin's feelings toward Padme, they were very genuine. Yes, he was very much attracted to her, very much infatuated, but at least he had those feelings, genuine feelings, and yeah. wow, she's so like brave why strong you know beautiful but then when it came to uh natalie portman talking about padme she's just like "Woo, he is hot oh and i'm God. like Bruh. 
hey. with that being said, yeah. I don't think, and I and I agree with Hayden's interpretation. While he, while Anakin found Padme so very beautiful, yeah, that I don't is... think that was on his mind all the time. Like Sarah, yeah, he had those very also, intense, intense is... strong feelings. Also, that is also in the uh, Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones special feature. Yes, I believe it is, because Hayden goes on that whole thing about how, oh well, Anakin's so deeply infatuated with her; she's so beautiful. He, she, all that, whatnot, everything that you just said, and in the novelizations, I believe I can't remember which ones there were, and uh, in the comics. He's still deeply infatuated with Padme to a varying degree, and he's been constantly thinking about her for just about 10 years since, like, the last time he saw her, which, according to the movies, novelizations, comics, etc., etc., was after he became a full-fledged Jedi, and after he was basically at the uh, ceremony on Naboo whenever they whenever the Gungans and the Naboo declared peace so from that point all the way until the beginning of episode 2 where Anakin and Obi-Wan are basically tasked with protecting Padme full time from any potential dangers or threats or assassinations etc uh, he's been thinking about her constantly non-stop and it's very <clears throat> showing that he has actual direct feelings towards this woman. And I don't think the same can really be said for Padme because she expressly says that she still thinks of him as that 10 year old kid on Tatooine, which really fucks with his, like. Oh, wait. Okay. Maybe that yes. doesn't fuck with him a lot, but I don't know. No, yes, that was like a bam, like a wasted moment from GTA. But, um, the one thing that, remember how before they were going to presumably die in the arena on Geonosis, um, and she confesses to him finally. Yeah. And I think it was like, like, seeing him again, now that he's an adult, obviously very infatuated with Anakin, mm -hmm. but I think in the novel it went into detail on how much Padme loved um how anakin was super expressive with himself you know regardless of being a jedi he was he wore his heart on his sleeve and he is a good person because he truly does and that is and this is true about anakin that i don't think a lot of people give him enough credit for i know he's not he's not you know he doesn't have good control of his emotions right uh, we'll be honest but he is a good person in the way that he wants to fight for the little guy he wants to and when he feels like something is wrong, he wants to do something about it. But, you know, obviously, again, having to fight with the Jedi te against Jedi, you know, doctrine, um, their teachings of like being super like um, stringent. Yeah. You know, it's hard. And again, but, that whole know. thing like relays to how the Jedi expressly like they want or they require uh, children as young as like newborns or by the age of one to be in the Jedi Order, because I say this a lot, like, in one of my videos, but the Jedi mainly just want young minds and, like, toddlers to shape and manipulate so they can effectively have their own, like, blank canvas to impose their will on. Because, like, that's why uh, both Luke and Anakin were refused by the Jedi to be trained in the ways of the Jedi, because oh, hey, we can't implement our will onto a 10-year-old kid and someone who's, like, well, Luke was effectively, like, 21 by the time uh, Empire Strikes Back started, I think? Or something like that? He was I either 21 or so. probably, like, somewhere so. around 20. But either way, um, the whole deal is basically we want children to shape their minds in our vision, and we want them to be the most ideal versions of Jedi that we can make them. But the problem, like, right there, is that you have a nine-year-old kid who spent his entire life as a slave being beaten black and blue by Watto and being nearly killed on multiple situations, 
and who has like a deep connection with his mother to the point where he actually thinks about not leaving Tatooine because he knows that uh, he's going to miss her a lot and he doesn't want to leave her on a desolated planet filled to the brim with slavers while she is actively still a slave. Like that is an issue for him but the only reason why he ends up leaving in the first place is because that she tells him to because she doesn't want her kid to suffer on a planet filled to the brim with slavers, mercenaries, uh, bounty hunters, huts, uh, raiders, Tusken Raiders and all that. So like a life as a Jedi traveling around the galaxy doing whatever the hell he wants to do is a lot better than staying on Tatooine. But also it's a horrible situation either way because either he becomes either he stays on the desolated Tatooine or he becomes effectively a slave for the Jedi Order. So it's not fun either way. If Qui-Gon hadn't died, it would have been so much easier. Oh yeah, definitely. Because instead of getting like Obi-Wan Kenobi who's trying to stick to the Jedi Code as much as physically possible, he would have gotten Qui-Gon Jinn who already on a constant basis, tells the Jedi Order to go fuck themselves. Because he doesn't want to listen to their hypocrisy and their crap. He's just like, what the? No, I'm going to train this kid. Go, why? He was so desperate to do it too. Even to the point where it low-key offended Obi-Wan. Oh, yeah. But he could brush it off quickly. Yeah, because like, <clears throat> Obi-Wan just thought that he wanted, that Qui-Gon just wanted him out of the way. So he could train yeah. Anakin, but Obi-Wan genuinely thought that, yeah, you're you're fine. You're ready to become a Jedi. We've only been hanging out for like five, six years, maybe. But yeah, going back to uh I think I think we should probably go back to Anakin and Pad Padme, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like the whole deal with Padme and Anakin was simply the fact that there was some deep infatuation and there are actual theories on Reddit and on Tumblr and, uh, what was that last one? Uh, either way. There's some theories on Reddit and all these other websites that Anakin was unintentionally using the Force and maybe possibly manipulating Padme into falling in love with him, but that doesn't really work out because they spend a long period of time away from each other and apparently the force only works on the weak-minded and apparent and padme is anything but really i was gonna say i've heard that theory too and i also disagree with that sentiment um because you're right padme is by far like the least like weak-minded individual oh yeah like really far from it so then like <clears throat> episode one I'm, it still weirds me out, episode one, because, of course, we have a 10-year-old uh, kid portraying a 10-year-old kid, Jake Lloyd, but also we have, like, an 18-year-old Natalie Portman trying to portray a, I think it was 13-year-old Padme Amidala? Um... Maybe she was 14. I want to say, wait, well, no. I think, I think uh, Natalie Portman was actually 15 at the time. Was she? I think so. Because okay. think about it. Okay, I, Phantom I Menace came out in 99, right? But mm. it takes at least a year or and a half or, or like two to shoot the movie itself. Right, because they started production in 97. Right. And so by the time uh, Attack of the Clones was released... Natalie Portman had to have been like the same age as um, Hayden. Right. So yeah. she was probably 15 when the movie started production. And then by the time yeah. the movie was finished and editing had been done, soundtrack and all that, she would have been about 17 and probably would have been starting college by then. Most likely. Wait, actually, let me look this up. <clears throat> all right, take your time. I could just edit this in post anyway. <laughs> I will take my time, and I'm glad you told me to take my time, because I will always take my time. Mm. How old was Natalie Portman when she played Padme? She 
16 when she started filming. Ah, there we go. Please. 16 when she started filming, 97 to 99, two years. So she would have been 18 whenever it was done. And it was in theaters. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now we know that. So then Hayden Christensen comes along, portrays Anakin Skywalker. He's about 19. She's about 19. Maybe a little bit older. I'm not sure. I don't know who's older, Aunt Hayden or. Um, Padme is most. Wait, okay, wait. Are we talking after At, or? Uh, Hayden and uh, Natalie. Because uh, I, I definitely know question. that uh, Anakin's supposed to be older. And no, uh, Padme's older because she was 13 or 14 and Anakin was 10, coming on 11. Oh, yeah, no, no. Um, Padme was like 14, 15. Uh huh. And, and Anakin so, was 10, so that's fun. Hold on. Um, I'm finding it. Okay, wait, hold on. Okay, so she was 16 years old when filming, and then her final exams are also the reason she couldn't attend the premiere night of the movie. Yeah. She missed the premiere she of Phantom Menace. She missed the Hollywood Menace. premiere of Phantom Menace because she had to go to her college finals. That's insane. That is crazy. Like, I'm I'm sure they would have given her an extension, but you know, imagine going up to your fucking professor and saying, Oh hey, I can't go I can't do the final exams. I need to go to the premiere of this movie that I'm doing. That's insane. Well, she was in high school, senior year of high school. Oh, well then um, fuck high school. Who who cares about finals in high school? She got uh, to Harvard kind of, anyway. She wanted to get into college. Um so Attack of the Clones began production in 2000, which would make Natalie Portman around 19 years old. Yeah. So, yeah. So she was the same age as Hayden. Fantastic. Or, yeah. Would have been really awkward to have a... <sighs> that wouldn't have worked either way because it's supposed to be 10 years later. So Padme would have been about 23 and Anakin still would well, have been about 20. No, uh, I mean, Natalie and Hayden... Um, here, let me, let me check how old he was. Hayden, oh, actually, Hayden was older. What? Oh, Hold on. Interesting. No, okay, they're the same age. They're the same age. Okay, so Hayden was just 19 years old when he de he debuted as the future Darth Vader in episode two. Hell yeah. So, yeah, so they're, the actors are the same age, but Padme is most definitely, like, significantly older. Oh yeah, than by like four years, yeah. easy. Yeah. Four or five. I like how we just talked about Padme and Aunt, like just Padme for forty minutes. That's great. I mean, that's what a podcast is, right? Yeah, and it's, it's still going, so that's a good sign on my end. But I don't know how long we wanted this to be because it's already been like forty minutes. I mean, we could we can cap it here if you want. All right, we'll cap it here. That's forty minutes. That's good enough. I can edit this. And then we'll be fine. <laughs> so that's the end of the podcast. We'll talk more later. Uh, I don't know Ooh. what we're going to talk about next. Time I don't know do what the... we're going to talk about next, but I know it's going to be really fucking fun. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> so anyway, uh, hit that like button, hit that share button, subscribe, do whatever you want. I don't have an OnlyFans, unfortunately, but I might get one. <laughs> no, stop. No, you don't. Don't yes, listen do. to him. I, I need one. Him. I need one. I need the OnlyFans. <laughs>